Thank you. You can all be seated. So we are here this morning for the funeral services and to pay tribute to a valiant son of God who has returned home. Our dear husband, friend, father, uh, brother Chris Allen Iyer. Uh, I am Bishop Anderson. I will be conducting today. Uh, Elder Quentin L. Cook is on the stand with me. He will be presiding at these services. I will go through and read the program in, in its entirety for uh, recording purposes. So those who watch it in the future will know what's going on. So Chris Allen Iyer, born March 13th, 1947 in Salt Lake City, Utah. He died December 4th, 2023 in Fremont, California. Uh, Paul Bears will be Adam Iyer, a son, Samuel Iyer, a son, Benjamin Iyer, a son, Michael Rotar, a son-in-law, Brennan Rotar, a grandson, Nathan Iyer, a grandson, Seamus Iyer, and Jackson Iyer, both grandsons. The honorary Paul Bears will be Joseph Iyer, a missionary, Calvin Iyer, a missionary, Richard Iyer, a brother, Rollin Iyer, a brother, Lynn Peterson, brother-in-law, Calvin Hunsaker, brother-in-law, Jesse Hunsaker, brother-in-law, and Mike Dryden, a brother-in-law. We just had a family prayer that was given by uh, Chris's son, Benjamin Iyer. It was a beautiful family prayer. Uh, the prelude music and organist will be Brother Kenneth Benyon from the CTEM Missionary, and CTM is Canada Toronto East Mission, uh, and Sister Kimberly Iyer will be our chorister today. Uh, we'll open with hymn number 108, The Lord is My Shepherd, after which we'll have an invocation by Sister Ashley Iyer, a daughter-in-law. Thank you. 
Our dear, kind Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this time we have to gather here to honor our beloved Chris Iyer. We're thankful for his legacy that he's given us. Please bless us during this meeting to feel joy and comfort that we were able to be touched by his kindness, his generosity, his wisdom, and his gentleness. But we are thankful for his example as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we are so thankful For all that he has taught us through, through his gentleness and love. Pray as we listen in our, and remember the beautiful moments in his lives so that our hearts will be touched to know how we can continue on his legacy and find others to serve and help like he did. We bless those that are speaking and participating in the program today that they will feel calm and and we are thankful for the opportunity we have to be here to celebrate his life and we pray for these in Jesus name, amen. Thank you for that. Uh, we will proceed with a eulogy by Elisha Iyer Rotar, after which we will then be pleased to hear from Adam Iyer, a son. There will then be a musical number, I See a Hero, uh, which the words are on the back of your program. If you want to follow along, uh, they will be accompanied by Lindsay Iyer on the piano and Sister Mary Iyer Real on the viola, after which we will then hear from Samuel Iyer, a son, and then a, another son, Benjamin Iyer, will speak. We'll then have a musical number, Our Savior's Love. Uh, the vocals will be by the CTEM missionaries, organized by Brother Kenneth Benyon and accompanied by Sister Linda Smith. We will then have closing remarks by Elder Quentin L. Cook, and we will close with hymn number 293, Each Life That Touches Ours for God, after which we'll then have a benediction by Sister Lindsay Iyer, the daughter-in-law. Before I begin, I just wanted to express gratitude to um, Bishop Anderson for the attentive way that he has um, helped our family to organize today's program and this building. This building is a special place to my father's family. It is um, the building that he attended church when he grew up. Um, I also wanted to express gratitude to Elder Cook for his presence today. It's also very special to my father's family, in particular to my father. He shared with us often that uh, Elder Cook was a mentor to him after he returned from his mission. And my father was a young man and uh, had lost his own father. So thank you for being here. Today we honor a man that has touched and blessed countless lives. I believe perhaps none so blessed as mine, however, because somehow I had the privilege of being his only daughter, or as he affectionately called me, his princess. My father grew up in humble circumstances, the second of five children. He lost his father to cancer at the tender age of 13. My grandmother often reflected on what a kind and helpful young man he was, always attentive to her and his younger siblings. My father learned from a very young age the value of hard work, the preciousness of family, 
and the importance of faith in and reliance upon God. I have often pondered on how these primitive experience must, experiences must have molded the manner in which he intentionally chose to live the rest of his life. Serving a full-time mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints during his college years was a turning point for my father. It was this experience that he attributed greatly to a growth in confidence and a passion for goal setting. Upon the long ride, boat ride home from Great Britain, he envisioned and wrote down long-term goals for his life. He continued this practice of dreaming big and setting goals throughout his life. The majority of these early written goals he achieved. However, there were a few exceptions. One goal was to date a lot of people and not fall in love with the first girl he met. Well, the first girl he met was my mother. And although he fought it for two years, continuing to date many, he eventually gave in. He learned that sometimes you need to be flexible with your goals. Though a visionary and very successful in his career as a venture capitalist, my father always recognized that his faith and his family or where some of his most important goals lie. I began benefiting from this from a very young age. At the beginning of my father's time at Harvard Business School, I was born. My dad quickly realized that the competitive nature of his program demanded extremely long hours of study and could in fact easily consume all of his time. Prayerfully with my mother, he set some boundaries. He determined that he would stop studying each night at 8 p.m. so that he could spend some time with my mother and I. He also determined that he would not study on Sundays, keeping that day as a sacred Sabbath dedicated to God and to family. Although obtaining a graduate degree from Harvard was another of my father's early goals, he was not willing to sacrifice things of more importance to him. Fairly certain that this course of action would keep him from making it through his first year of graduate school, he pressed on with hard work and hope. And to him, miraculously, he completed his degree. This pattern led my father to make similar decisions throughout his career, intentional decisions that have bonded our family together and blessed us in innumerable ways. Another goal that my father set while returning home from his missionary service was to have meaningful study of the scriptures each day. My father loved getting up early before the sun rose and before needing to go to work to study the word of God. He loved the quiet morning hours before the rest of the world was awake and the time they allowed him to be alone with the Lord. He continued this practice of early daily scripture study throughout his life. In fact, it was one of the final acts he clung to. I recall just about a month ago, while visiting my parents' home, my father gathering all of his study materials, turning on quiet music, and bowing his head in prayer. The music, I need thee every hour, was praying, playing in the background. That image will forever be in my mind. My father always included in his goal setting specifics about the type of relationships he'd like to have with family members. Whenever he and my mother would go on trips together, they would spend time dreaming and talking about each of the children and how to nourish and build us. I'm grateful that from a very young age, my father created space and time for me. My father was very wise and easy to talk to. Throughout my life and into my adult years, I always felt safe consulting with him about anything, knowing, what, knowing I would walk away feeling listened to, loved, believed in, and inspired. I will always remember how he made me feel. Safe, important, treasured. He created a space inside of me from a very young age that allowed me to more fully recognize the spirit and God's love for me because it felt familiar. It felt like how I felt in his love. 
It's a type of love that motivates above anything else and that has helped me to endure some of the hardest things, leading me to trust and continue to try. I want to live and walk in the spirit like my dad, be wise like him, be peaceful like him, find joys in the way he does. During some of my final visits with my father, he shared with me something that he hoped I would share with our family to use as a motto after his passing. He wisely knew that we would need time to mourn our separation from him. But he hoped that rather than turning inward for too long, we would choose to use that grief to reach out, to notice and bless others. He calls this giving over grief. So I ask each of us today cons to consider ways we can honor my father's memory by pausing to really notice others and choosing to give. As we lift others' burdens, we will lift our own as well. And we will share a sacred gift with my father this Christmas season, as we also honor the one who gave his all for all of us, our savior, Jesus Christ who always chose giving over grief. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Remember who you are. This is what my dad would always say to me whenever he dropped me off for school at Hopkins Junior High for seventh and eighth grade. Okay, Dad, I will. I love you. Was my usual my, was my usual response. It wasn't a question he was asking me, so it didn't need a specific response, but it was an invitation to look inward and think about who I am and who I was becoming. Who was I? I was an ire, a brother, a son, a student, a friend. But most importantly, his invitation was directing me to reflect on who I was eternally. I was a child of God with infinite and divine potential. My dad knew who he was, and he wanted me to make sure that I knew the same. As written in his obituary, he was a man of faith who intentionally chose to organize his life in a manner consistent with his priorities. There are several ways that my dad <clears throat> impacted my life um, with this intentionality. One of the first things I remember, <clears throat> um, a fondness for my dad was something he started with me when I was around seven or eight years old that he affectionately called Daddy Talks. And we would set goals together and talk about eternal priorities. He created a little um, notebook that had different tabs in it for different categories like relationships and eternal goals and habits and um, things, like, things like that. Um, we would set goals together and he'd, he'd put a little circle next to it and then when, when uh, I would complete it, I was so proud because I could use my dad's pen and color in the circle. Another thing that impacted me greatly was his, de his decision to retire from a very financially rewarding business early to be with our family. My dad was blessed to be at the right in the right place at the right time professionally and thus did very well financially to the point that he was able to choose to retire at the age of 39 or, or 40 to spend more time with our family. As an 11 year old boy, this was life changing for me. As an 11 year old boy, you're just figuring out what it is to be a man and, and what things are important in life. And so for my dad to teach me by example that all this money stuff is, is something, but our family is the most important. And for him to, to take a more active part in my life was 
was tremendous. Also, of course, his ability to love. And all of you know, know about that. My dad truly is my hero. Oh, how I long to be like him. Although I fall short, his unending love and an expression of <clears throat> and an expression of joy in who I am becoming and how proud he is of me have meant the world to me. He is very Christ-like in that way. When we who are trying our best to follow the Savior, and when we fall short, Jesus never demeans us, but encourages us and cheers us on. My dad loved the scriptures. And he loved listening to inspirational music to lift him and bring light to his scripture study. He has a beautiful playlist that he calls Music for Light. As an adult, I have observed as he studies the scriptures, he would record thoughts in a journal and write down thoughts and goals on some index cards that he would keep in his pocket to refer to throughout the day. One card would contain personal or family goals and tasks. One was for service, one was for work-related things, and one was for to-dos at home. Another card was a reminder of things that made him happy. And another one was called and written at the top, what I believe and know. My dad knew and believed the following ideas as recorded on some of his handwritten cards that he would write and keep in his pocket. I reviewed these cards after he passed. He was in his room. And I witness and testify of these things as well. God knows me and loves me. Therefore, he has a plan for me. He is refining me in the furnace of affliction. He is a craftsman applying fire to me to remove all impurities and thus produce pure gold. The Lord knows all things from the beginning. He is tutoring me. He is with me even when I'm in a prison pit. I will, never, I will never be given a burden I can't bear with his help. In trials, I can become bitter or better. Trials will be but a small moment, so endure them well. In the end, all wrongs will be made right. If obedient, the plan will all work out. Be faithful, endure well, let God prevail, trust, accept, move on and act. The Lord is merciful. He will lift and strengthen when needed, when asked. The Lord says, be of good cheer. I will lead you along. Fear not, worry not. God wants me to serve. Be on the Lord's errand list. Say, here am I. And then, of course, the reference that Jesus fought the good fight and the victory is won. My dad knew that Jesus had overcome all. And by so doing, Jesus lays claim to any person who enters into a covenant path and takes upon him the name of Christ. By so doing... We all become part of his flock, and he becomes our shepherd. He is the good shepherd, the one who leaves the 90 and 9 and seeks after the one who is lost and brings them back to the fold. We are his, and he calls us by his name. Oh, what great joy that thought brought to my dad and what it should bring to us to know that we belong to Jesus, that we are his and that he calls us by his own name. That is who we are. That is who I am. I thank you, Dad, for teaching me to remember who I am. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Today I would like to speak about angels. In the scriptures, we read phrases like angels of God, angels of the Lord, angels of heaven, angels, spirits, innumerable company of angels, ministering of angels, angels having charge over them, angels round about you, among others. In the Book of Mormon, in Moroni chapter 11, verse 27 and 29, it reads, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, have miracles ceased because Christ hath ascended into heaven and hath sat down on the right hand of God? And because he hath done this, my beloved brethren, have miracles ceased? Behold, I say unto you, nay, neither have angels ceased to minister unto the children of men. Elder Kent F. Richards of the Quorum of the Seventy told this story in General Conference. 13-year-old Sherry underwent a 14-hour operation for a tumor on her spinal cord. As she regained consciousness in the intensive care unit, she said, Daddy, Aunt Cheryl is here, and Grandpa Norman, and Grandma Brown are here. And Daddy, who is that standing beside you? He looks like you, only taller. He says you're, he's your brother Jimmy. Her Uncle Jimmy had died at age 13 of cystic fibrosis. For nearly an hour, Sherry described her visitors, all deceased family members. Exhausted, she then fell asleep, 
Later, she told her father, Daddy, all of the children here in the intensive care unit have angels helping them. In 2 Nephi chapter 32, verse 3, it reads, Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. For the past several years, I have had some, some real struggles with depression and anxiety. And during those times, I've often felt the Holy Ghost comforting me and providing much needed peace. Just a couple of weeks ago, as I was lying in bed, I felt the Holy Ghost comforting me again. But this time it was accompanied by a feeling that my angel dad was also near speaking peace and warmth to my heart. Again, angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. And the other, and the other day while I was at work at our assisted living home, where we care, we care for elderly residents, many of which have memory loss. I was helping a dear lady who was asking where she was and where her husband was. I have had this conversation many times with this sweet lady and have learned what to say and what not to say. In this case, I explained to her where she was. She was very excited to hear that she was in Provo. She was a little less excited to hear that her husband had passed away years ago but comforted to know where he was and that they would be reunited soon. She was a bit tearful, but we had a good talk that I think brought her some comfort. And just in case the conversation did not bring her comfort, we went and got a brownie and a Pepsi. <laughs> I'm telling you this story because while I was speaking to her, I could again sense the comforting presence of my angel dad nearby, coming to see what I was doing at our assisted living home and giving me strength to help this dear lady. My dad has always been very interested in what his kids are doing and where they are. Even as adults, he was always tracking us on the location, you know, the app, find my app. And if we got disconnected, he'd be like, Sam, we need to reconnect so I can know where you are. And I think now he is enjoying the, the ability to visit us wherever we are as our angel father. For as long as I can remember, my dad would get up early in the morning as many of my siblings has talked about and, and study the scriptures. And he had all these colors of index cards where he'd write his goals. And now I can picture my angel dad now perhaps with different index cards in the spirit world, guiding what he does there. I think he has a pink heart card for Hetty, which is probably his most important card. Maybe he has a green card for his children, including their spouses because he always made it clear that they were just as dear to him as his own children. Maybe he has a blue card for his grandkids. Maybe he has a turquoise card for his siblings, cousins, and friends, and missionaries from the Toronto mission, and others he loves. And maybe he has a purple card for his ancestors also living in the spirit world with him. I can picture him with a stack of index cards. I think he is making plans on how he can minister to all of us comfort us, cheer for us, uplift us, and point us to Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 19 to 22, we read, In this life, only if we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. I am so grateful for Jesus Christ and the knowledge that because of him, my dad still lives and will be resurrected again. I am so grateful to know that my angel dad is not gone forever, but that I can continue to feel him close even now and know that I will be with him again in the eternities. I am so blessed to have a wonderful, I, have, I was so blessed to have a wonderful earthly father. And now I feel so blessed to have a wonderful angel father. The really neat thing is that while we are saying goodbye to our husband, father, grandpa, brother, friend, mission president, so many wonderful things my dad did, we also have the opportunity to cherish an ongoing relationship with him as our angel husband, angel father, angel grandpa, angel brother, angel friend, angel mission president until we meet again in heaven.
I grieve at the loss of my dad, but I but it's overwhelmed with more joy that like, he's not gone. He's he's angel dad now. And um, I look forward to that relationship that I'll continue to have with him while I'm still alive. And then his embrace um, when I move to the other side of the veil. And all of this is made possible because of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who I love with all my heart. And I share that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming today to honor our dad. My mom and dad had, had five children and uh, you're hearing from them in reverse birth order. And when we found out a couple of months ago that my dad had terminal cancer, uh, we decided that we were gonna uh, increase the value of all the airlines. <clears throat> None of us live in California and it suddenly became a flurry of schedules and airplane rides. Uh, to, to go out and visit mom and dad and to support them. And <clears throat> during my last visit, uh, before my dad passed, I remember driving to go get dinner and uh, had a little bit of quiet time in the car and was just thinking of, you know, my siblings and, and just us kind of, you know, traversing back and forth and back and forth. And suddenly I had uh, the impression of, of Aaron being next to me. Uh, he is the uh, the fifth child of my parents and uh, the greatest of us all. And unfortunately, you won't be able to hear from him today because he, he passed away in 2019. And I could feel as we were making preparations on this side that Aaron was hurriedly making preparations on the other side for dad. And if you can see with your heart and look with your feelings, uh, you know, we obviously have my father's body here in front of us, and we, we can feel his presence here as well, his spirit. Uh, but there are, there are additional spirits here, and, and especially for us, there's two that shine really bright, and that is Chris and Aaron reunited together. Um, my dad is my rock. He provided a beautiful blueprint on how to live. And I'd like to share with you just, just five principles I learned from observing his blueprint for a meaningful and happy life. First, my dad could see the best in people. He saw their incredible potential and encouraged them to achieve it. From my earliest memories, I remember my dad believing in me. I remember him telling me, Ben, you have greatness in you. You can accomplish anything in this life that you set your mind to. And I believed him in that assurance from him became foundational to my personal confidence. While I was looking through some of my dad's old things, uh, you've heard over and over how much he loved to write. This is a, a beautiful letter that he wrote to my brother Aaron when he was at the Holiday Inn in Hong Kong in November 18th, 1989. This is when Aaron was only four years old. But listen to the words that he wrote to Aaron knowing, as he said, you are currently too young to read this letter, but I hope it will be meaningful to you later. He closes his letter with these words, Aaron, you can be great. You can be anything you desire. Dream big, work hard, and never give up, never, never. I'm proud of you and feel so blessed to be your father. I can hardly wait to get home and hug you. Second, my dad valued relationships, especially with family above all else. He valued relationships above money, achievements, career success, or anything. When I was young, as you've heard, he left a very lucrative career to spend more time with us as kids. From my third to eighth grade years, he coached my CYO basketball team. That's like junior jazz in California. In a time before positionless, positionless basketball, he put his tallest player, me, as point guard. We had a play cleverly named Batman. I don't remember the details of the play, but he taught it to us over and over again in practice. 
The first time we used this play in a game, I came down the court, dribbling the ball and shouted out the play, Batman! To our surprise, everybody on the court froze. The defense and my teammates. So I dribbled straight to the hoop and got an easy layup. And ever thereafter, our parents were always saying, run Batman, run Batman. Over the six years that dad was my coach, he taught me many important life lessons, lessons like patience and kindness and sportsmanship and teamwork and love. More importantly, though, I realize now as an adult what he had sacrificed in terms of accolades and career success to simply spend more time with me as a kid. This is a priceless treasure to me. My dad lost his father when he was only 13, and I feel so lucky that I had mine for over four decades. Third, my dad demonstrated constant love and devotion to our dear mother, Hetty. Chris and Hetty are a powerful duo, and yet those are not quite the right words. They are incredibly reunited as one. I learned so much from my dad, just observing how he treated my mom, how he loved and he adored her, how he never belittled her, how he was quick to ask for her forgiveness when he was short or in some way had offended her. I know that mom will continue to feel his tender love from the other side of the veil. Fourth, my dad knew the secret to happiness is serving others. He devoted his life to service, including teaching seminary, serving as a missionary, a bishop, a mission president, and so many other roles. He was involved in intrafaith volunteer work, leadership communities, and building a network of powerful philanthropy. My dad used to tell me, son, even if you were the most selfish person in the world and only desired your own happiness, you'd be wise to get out and serve others because that is the only way to be truly happy. And the last principle I'd like to share is the most important. My dad showed us how to be a disciple of Christ. He always had inspirational scriptures and quotes taped to our refrigerator. And when I went to visit him recently, one of these papers caught my eye. It simply said in words going down the center of the page, charity, Jesus Christ, and then me with a question mark. And then it lists the attributes of charity, which are suffereth long, is kind, envieth not, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, never faileth. I love that my dad was pondering whether or not he had these attributes when we all know that he had them in spades. He was always striving to develop himself to be a little more like our savior, Jesus Christ. After my dad received his cancer diagnosis, many of his friends and colleagues and you shared personal experiences that you had with Chris Iyer. Here are some of the common themes from them. You were always there with a smile and a twinkle in your eye and the most supportive of friends. You have always exhibited the highest qualities of character and integrity. You've always, and I truly mean always, been gentle, kind, thoughtful, polite, and everything else that today's society isn't. I am grateful to have counted you as one of my most impactful friends. My father left us his written testimony of our Lord and Savior. To close, I'd like to read some of his words to you. I want each of you to know that I have a deep faith in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I know he is my and your personal Savior. I know he loves you. He loves us very individually and personally. He knows me and you with perfect knowledge. He knows what deep and shallow struggles you may be going through, and he desires to lift and bless you in a way that is best best in terms of refining us and helping us become more like him. Therefore, those blessings may not correspond with our wishes nor our timing, but that help will come at the right time and in the right way as we strive to be, become submissive, meek and humble, patient and full of love, 
willing to submit to all things that he seeth to inflict upon us. I know that my Jesus, your Jesus, suffered for our transgressions. I know that the atonement is real. I know that he will always extend his arms to each of us. That he will give us chance after chance after chance to repent and come unto him. Please never feel that you are beyond the reach of his love. That is a lie. He will always love you, will always be willing to forgive you. Close quote. I love you, Dad. You are my rock. Thank you for the amazing blueprint you left for us and the thousands of life you impacted for good. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
<clears throat> Beloved family and friends, missionaries, uh, what a joy to be here this morning. I feel like we have been so edified and so blessed. I'm grateful that uh, Chris uh, wanted me to participate in this. I've been uh, close to Chris and, and Rick for a very long time and uh, very much appreciated uh, this opportunity. I didn't know how uh, I knew it'd be touching because of my relationship with Chris, but uh, uh, this is our old uh, building. I guess the 18th Ward doesn't exist anymore. It's been merged into the fifth, but uh, to be here where uh, I grew up and was the sacrament and, and watched the Iyer family and what they were doing. I think some of you, but uh, maybe most don't know that uh, I moved into this ward when I was 12 years old. Uh, that lived down in the Sani block where Elder Perry and Nama Sani and uh, moved up uh, to near the Adams School, which was in this ward. And uh, Chris's father, Dean, was in the bishopric. I had a very, very active mother and uh, who loved the gospel and a father who was as wonderful as anybody could be, but just not active at all. And, uh, and everybody else in the deacon's quorum's father was active in the church. And uh, I talked about this in general conference one and once. And uh, I remember the first uh, father sent out, and I think it was a running priesthood. And, Chris's father, uh, Dean, invited me to go with him. And, and he was so wise. I think he knew how much I loved and respected my father. And he didn't want to in any way deprecate my father. And he did that so well. He says, look, I'm not a replacement for your father, but I want you to be with the, the young man and go with them. And so he, uh, I went as his companion to my father and son outing over in Bear Lake. And I was very close to him as a, as a result of that, as I was uh, growing up. Uh, at that time, when I was uh, 12, uh, Chris was five, Rick was seven, and the other children, I don't, some of them weren't even here yet. Uh, but I, I was very close to him, including uh, in Dean's responsibilities at uh, Utah State University when I was there. And Dean uh, passed away, and just as I was going on a mission, he was only 39 years old. And at that time, uh, Chris was 13, and, and uh, kind of a difficult time to, to lose your father. I do want to say what a wonderful mother uh, the whole Iyer family had. Uh, Ruth Swenson, just unbelievable. I think there are some people that are almost old enough like I am to remember her well and, and her parents. Elder Perry was in the same high school class at Logan High School with uh, Ruth Swenson. 
He said she was the sweetest and the kindest and the smartest girl in the class. <laughs> and uh, she uh, undertook raising these children after the passing of her dear husband. And uh, we have to give her a lot of credit. The Swensons that uh, were fabulous, her, her parents were in this world and were fabulous. And, and many relatives, wonderful writers. Uh, when, one of, this, one of the, his, uh, Chris's children was talking about Chris being he, he maybe got some of that from the Irish side, but he may have gotten some of that from the Swenson side as, uh, as well. Uh, I, uh, I followed Chris from a distance. Uh, I, I did have a chance. I was only back one year from, from when I came back off a of mission. I had my dad not uh, uh, wanting me to go on a mission. I, my brother had a strategy. If you could graduate in three years, Utah State, then you could gain back one of the years that you served on a mission. So I was only one year before I went to Stanford Law School. But Chris was at a critical age at that time. And, and my calling was an advisor to the young man just in that one year. And, uh, and I got very, very close to him. That's when I got to know him really, really well. Well, I was very pleased to watch him as he uh, did such wonderful things. Uh, I was pleased, I had served a mission in England. I was pleased that he went to uh, Great Britain on his mission, the Central British Mission. Uh, Birmingham, we just were reading about this week in Church News, is the location where the temple in Birmingham, England will be. He, will, uh, he would love that and I think he'll have it, a sense that that's going on. And then, uh, because I was on the San Francisco Peninsula when when he went to Harvard and I just, I was aware of that and proud of him, but not, didn't know too much of what occurred there. Then he came to San Francisco with Bank of America. And I think maybe, I don't know, I'd have to ask Eddie, but uh, I think the first place they lived or near the first was on the San Francisco Peninsula where we lived. And so for a really brief period there, I uh, had a chance to reconnect with Chris on the San Francisco Peninsula. He was, uh, part of the Bank of America's uh, venture investing business at a very early stage for venture capital. When you look back now and you tell the years that uh, Chris was in the venture capital world, it was it was in the, the babyhood almost of, of venture capital work. And uh, in my legal practice, had a chance to get to know him a little bit and do a little legal work here in uh, Merrill and Pickard and Anderson and Iyer established their venture capital firm uh, on the peninsula and he ended up there in Fremont. What I loved about him was his kindness and his goodness and his character and his integrity, <clears throat> but he truly wanted people to fulfill their dreams. So entrepreneurs who wanted to fulfill their dreams found somebody who could really help them. And that's why he was so successful uh, in the venture capital world. I uh, got to watch him as he was accomplishing so much over there in, in Fremont, over there's across the San Francisco Bay. That's my, that's where I, I, I got to make myself clear here. There's a bay between the peninsula and Fremont where they live. And <clears throat> I'd get to see him, <clears throat> excuse me, occasionally I see President Kirk and others from Fremont that are, that are here uh, that, uh, as well as people from childhood, from 18th Ward, as well as missionary. I'm grateful for that. Uh, he raised with Hetty, who he loves so dearly, and the great Hunsaker tradition that she came out of. And I think these children have been blessed entirely as well by that as the other traditions that they have. And what a what a blessing they've had. As I saw these missionaries uh, coming up, I, I couldn't help but thinking of him as their mission president. Uh, you go out as a mission president and you have children that you'll never forget and they'll always be central to your life. But suddenly you have another three to 400 additional children that look to you all the rest of their life. I was so pleased. Yesterday we met in the parking lot of where our uh, condominium is and this dear friend of ours, she, she, she says, what's coming up? She says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm tending 
uh, some, my little, some, my grandchildren for a day. She's going up to her mission president's uh, funeral tomorrow. So I don't know which one she was here, but she was one of them and her mother was tending her kids. Uh, for his missionaries, both Chris and Hetty were remarkable. Uh, the fact that he served on a British mission. Let me quote a little, something that Winston Churchill said, speaking of a great contemporary leader of his day. He lighted beacon fires, which are still burning. He sounded trumpet calls, whose echoes still call stubborn soldiers to the field. Beacon lights are usually lights on the shore that allow ships in dangerous weather to find a safe harbor. Trumpet calls for service to others and to God are a profound blessing to both family and friends and particularly to missionaries. Chris and Hetty were a beacon light and sounded just the right trumpet calls for them. And I love their, their message and their, uh, what they said to us. Now, he's a great missionary. He has been all of his life. He's always shared the gospel, even in business settings. Uh, I think that uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 138, uh, talking about one of the responsibilities that we have on the other side of the veil, says it very well. The faithful elders of this dispensation, when they depart from mortal life, continue their labors in the preaching of the gospel among those who are in the great world of the spirits of the dead. I don't have any question but what he will do that. Now, I loved uh, what uh, Sam Samuel said about his father and talking about angels. Uh, and I couldn't help thinking about uh, with the goal setting uh, and the strategic nature. If you wanted to know on all of the iron children, but Chris and, and his brothers and everybody, it, think about goals, thinking about being strategic, uh, thinking about watching over and caring for people. I love what President Joseph F. Smith taught about this kind of angel concept, a little different words. Surely those who pass beyond can see more clearly through the veil back here to us than it is possible for us to see to them from our sphere of action. I believe, now remember this is the prophet of the church, Joseph F. Smith. I believe we move and have our being in the presence of heavenly messengers and heavenly beings. We're not separated from them. We cannot forget them. We do not cease to love them. We will always hold them in our hearts and memory, and thus we are associated and united to them by ties that we cannot break. Those who have been faithful, and Chris has, who have gone beyond can see us better than we can see them. We live in their presence. They see us. They are solicitous, solicitous for our welfare. They love us now more than ever. Their desire for our well-being must be greater than that which we feel for ourselves. So when Samuel was saying that, I, I couldn't help but thinking of these uh, words of Joseph F. Smith. I had a desire to leave the Iyer family with basically two charges, and then I want to leave it a blessing. The first charge is to watch out for this wonderful mat matriarch of your family, Eddie Iyer. I'm confident that you will do that. I have no concerns on that, but I, I, I charge you with that. My second charge is to remain faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the legacy and that was the center of Chris Iyer's life. That is the most significant challenge that I can leave with you. Now, based on the apostolic keys that I have, I, I want to leave you with a blessing that you will serve and live your lives so that you can be reunited with this great heroic father, grandfather, mission president to so many of you that are here. I want to testify to you that his testimony, which was read so beautifully, is true. I testify to you that Jesus Christ did accomplish all those things that were so beautifully articulated. 
I also want to leave you an apostolic witness. I've got uh, many friends here and the family and these missionaries. And I want you to listen carefully. We are very careful not to share sacred spiritual experiences. Uh, President Packer or others have told us that we cannot have the Lord rely on us if we share those. But I want to say this in a way that you can understand it, but there'll be no mistake in your mind. I bear my solemn apostolic witness that I know the Savior's voice and I know the Savior's face. I'm a sure witness of the divinity of Jesus Christ. He lives. He guides his church. President Russell Nelson is his prophet. I desire to invoke a blessing on you that you'll be blessed as you strive to follow the Savior and accomplish his purposes here on earth. I invoke a blessing on you that you can be united in the future as you have in the past, that you will not let your lives drift apart, but that you'll be united not only to your family, but to Jesus Christ and his commandments and his atonement. I leave you my witness and my blessing and my appreciation for being with you here this morning. And I do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Our dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful to have been here today, gathered to fill of thy spirit and to celebrate and rejoice the life of Chris Iyer. We are most especially grateful to know that that life is not over. We're so grateful that he is still in our lives, that his example can guide us and that as an angel, he can minister unto us and help us as we struggle in, in this marvelous life. So grateful for the testimony that we feel in our hearts of my son, Jesus Christ. We're so grateful for the atonement that makes possible the blessings of the gospel that families can be together forever. We're so grateful that Hetty is not separated from her wonderful husband, but is with him forever. Please bless all of us that we can reach out to her and serve her, that we can work with Chris and taking care of her. We're so grateful that Aaron is now with his dad. We're just so grateful that we can all be together one day as well. Please help us keep these truths in our hearts in the coming days and months. And please help this Christmas to be especially beautiful because we have another angel in heaven who is in our hearts and in our minds. Please help us all to travel home and safety. I may say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>